Welcome to the module on concrete. Concrete is one of the most ubiquitous modern architectural materials. From concrete slab foundations that we find in homes across the United States and elsewhere, to the architecture of some of the modern period's most maligned, in fact, most hated architecture known as brutalism, concrete is the material par excellence for ma manifesting the will of its human architects and engineers. Why? Hold on and we'll dig in. Take a close look at this building. Responding to the discussion prompt above, send me either an email or respond in Slack to the following questions. What are the adjectives that you'd give to this building? How does it make you feel? And what do you think it was designed to say or to embody? I look forward to reading your responses. Now, what about this one? You can either continue your discussion prompt comparing and contrasting this building, the Pantheon, to Tato Ando's museum, which we saw in the last slide, or just focus on the first Tato Ando museum, whatever seems right for you. But as you look at this building, what adjectives would you give to it? How does it make you feel? And what prompts a difference in the way we would respond to this building from 126 CE? to the way we respond to Tatawando's building from the late 20th century. Just things for you to think through now, no need to write it down. But the other pressing question for this lecture today is just how is this building still standing? It's just under 2000 years old. And despite a little dirt, it looks as fresh as it did the day it was built. What is it about this particular type of concrete that we'll explore in the Pantheon? What is it about that material that held up, that was more durable than many concrete structures that we've built within the last 40 or 50 years? Again, we're returning to the Romans, but to ask how this ancient concrete is special, what makes it different? One answer to that question the question asked by the artist Richard Hamilton, which is just what makes today's home so different and so appealing. And in his collage and in our everyday life, we often respond technology. Technology is what distinguishes us from the ancient Romans of the past. But that's not what the Pantheon tells us, or at least there's a continuity between the technology of the Pantheon and the technology of today's most innovative architectural structures. So let's go back and look at what those technologies were to see how they may be equally pressing for us today. So you've watched the intro video from Khan Academy that gives us a, an overview of the Pantheon and you've had a terrific overview of a week or two ago from one of your colleagues, colleagues' TED Talks. Knowing what you know, what is the trajectory from this ancient form of concrete to modern iterations of the same materials? Take a stab at it in email form or in the Slack discussion. Here we're seeing the refined techniques of ancient Greek masonry, which later we see around the globe in different forms. It's a technique of leveling stones such that tiny little uneven points of pressure won't cause those stones to crack. If you can get layer upon layer of stone evenly laid, you'll have a solid and sturdy foundation across potentially centuries.
But what's required for that even layering of stone? As we saw in the Roman section and the section on arches and arcades, it requires skilled, skilled masons, people who are able to spend the time or who are forced or asked to spend the time to do careful carving and leveling work of stone. Mortar, this early form of concrete, was a shortcut. Made up of lime-based mortar, which is not lime the fruit, but lime the mineral deposit. This mortar is not a glue. It has little to no tensile strength, but it seals joints and forms uniform bedding between bricks or stones in order to distribute an even load. Mortar improves cost and speed over the time and care and skill that was needed to make perfect, perfectly flattened stones. The process of creating mortar recreates limestone itself chemically. But at the end of the process, it's a limestone shaped at the will and with the skill and help of masons. In other words, it's a natural material decomposed into man-made form and used toward human ends. The lime and tufa process does require air. Specifically, it requires CO2. So the problem with lime-based mortar is this. If you cast a thick mass of mortar, if you were wanting to build something with just the mortar, for example, the outer layer that comes in contact with the air will harden and form that limestone material. It will form such a thick crust, however, that the air can never get all the way to the inside of the mass that you've created. And that interior mass will never solidify into that hardened mortar form, into that recreated limestone. The Romans, however, were able to get around that. The way they got around it was by using a Pozzolana-based mortar. Pozzolana is a volcanic stone that was found in the Pozzolana region. The benefits is that if you combine the silica from this stone with lime and water, it creates calcium silicate hydrate, which does not need air to cure. In fact, it can cure underwater which is why we see bridges whose thick post and lintel structure can be created underwater and that, that concrete material will dry and be rock solid. Roman concrete comes in three forms. And you've seen this before in the brick lecture. We have opus insertum, where the inside is that concrete mixture. Stones are lining that concrete mixture and brick is placed on the outside for decorative as a decorative element. Opus reticulatum, where the concrete fill is again the structural material with bricks and veneer for decorative purposes. And then opus testaceum, same process, it's really the concrete doing the work in these materials. Although we've looked at it in terms of the development of brick, this was really the key moment of the consolidation of concrete as a key architectural material for the Roman Empire. All right, you've spent some time with the Pantheon in readings and in videos, and we know that when it was designed, it was designed as a house of the gods, Pantheon, the house of many gods, in fact. We did a little work last week on Art Deco, where we looked at the way that different geometry was really a signature mark of the Art Deco style, pairing circular shapes and cube forms. Let's take a look at the plan of the Pantheon for a second, thinking of it through that lens. What we have here, of course, is the conjunction of the round dome 
the domed rotunda of the Pantheon, and that front Greek temple architecture that in plan takes on a rectilinear form. Again, we can see the way that Art Deco reaches back to a different time. It wasn't the inventor of the thrill of geometry in, arch in architecture. Something else is at work in the Pantheon though. In addition to the recognizable portico, that frieze structure, the pediment, and even a second pediment here, the Pantheon had an intermediate block, which you can see in the image above. So that if you were standing straight in front of the Pantheon, the way that the surrounding architecture worked from a head-on view, the dome was a little bit obscured. And the reason for that was to create a sense of awe when, walk, when one walked into the building. If you were expecting a typical Greco-Roman temple, which is what the exterior portico is cueing you toward, when you walked in as a viewer, the awe of this round interior space would have blown one away as it does today for tourists, day in and day out. The Dome of the Pantheon is, to date, still an architectural marvel. It is the largest dome span of unreinforced concrete to date. How is it built? Let's take a minute to dig in. First, you can see that the interior of the rotunda is designed so that a perfect sphere could fit in. There are cultural religious re reasons for this, and also again that pleasure of geometry taking hold of the architects of the Pantheon. The dome of the Pantheon itself, built from Roman concrete, weighs 4,535 tons. The weight of that dome was so massive it was difficult, as we've seen in earlier presentations, to figure out how the thing could be built. How could it hold its own weight and still have this awe-inspiring hollow in the center? One of the keys to that is the oculus. We'll get to the oculus in a minute, but let's still focus on the weight of the dome. At the base of the dome, it's 21, thick, 21 feet thick. It narrows increasingly until it reaches 3.9 feet thick near the oculus. Not only is it narrowing to decrease the mass and weight of itself, the materials that are inside that dome become lighter and lighter and lighter as one moves toward the oculus. At the very thickest point at that 21 foot thick wall dimension, the aggregate or the material that is making up this mix of concrete includes travertine, like travertine tile. Sometimes people have this in their kitchens or bathrooms, or you may have seen it. Um, it's a marble-like material. And terracotta tile was also in there, the thing that you plant, pots for plants are generally made of. At the very top, however, the aggregate, that stone combination that's mixed in with the lime and the mortar. Instead, here there was tufa and pumice. And if you've ever held a pumice stone, it is exceedingly light. You can toss it up and down like you might toss a dry sponge. So by changing the materials that were making up the concrete, the dome became increasingly lighter. By changing the thickness of the walls, it became increasingly lighter. And then the cherry on top, or not on top, is the oculus. So in addition to the marvel of light beaming in through this 30 foot diameter opening at the top of the Pantheon, allowing daylight to come in, allowing the sunlight to move and shine on all the different gods represented in the circular hall of the Pantheon, this oculus was incredibly important for architectural reasons. By eliminating all material at the very top of the dome, the place where the dome is most vulnerable, it lightened the overall weight of the structure. 
a ring of voussoirs, those keystones that happen at the top of the arch, encircles that oculus opening. And as I'm showing you, that 30 foot, 30 foot by diameter, it gives you an idea of the scale of this building by realizing that this is, this building is probably larger than our lecture hall. Oh, excuse me, the oculus is wider than our lecture hall in scales. So not only is it visually striking, it is engineering-wise essential to the success of this dome. So that gives us a little background on the marbles of Roman concrete. And it was used in everything from this spectacular hall to everyday walls and structures, just as we use concrete today, from the glorious to the mundane. There's an ongoing discussion about what materials want to be in architecture. Now it sounds weird as if the materials themselves had volition, but the famous architect Louis Kahn once wrote, what does a brick want to be? No question has ever been more injurious to the field of architecture than this one. It assumes that the brick is mute and that the architect can divine its inner ambition. This question spoken by a master addressing a slave is how that is framed. What, what should I make you, says the architect. Instead, we're trying to rethink materials in their cultural value. We're trying to rethink them in their structural value to ask instead, what does a brick have to say? And we might do the same thing with concrete. but only today. Early concrete was at the whim of human architects and engineers. And you can see this in the image that I've placed at the right. Here we have two women in this stunning Art Deco patterning displayed in their coats. And above them, we have, above and behind, we have a series of concrete formed trees. This concrete was built as a prosthesis, an add-on, an assistant to human functions. The history behind these particular trees is that a landscape architect for the uh, exhibition in Paris that we looked at two slides ago, he had designed a perfect, what he thought would be a perfect park for the era, for the time. And when he got to Paris to set up that park and set up that installation, he realized the trees that he wanted weren't even in bloom this time of year in Paris as they might have been where he was coming from. And he felt that his whole plan was foiled. As a solution to the whims of nature, this landscape architect instead composed four perfectly identical concrete trees. And in doing so, he created an emergent manifesto for concrete, which is to say nature's materials are no longer needed. Instead, anything we want or desire can be made by humans and for humans out of man-made materials. Now, we, we know the ecological problems with this trajectory, and it's not a view that we embrace today. Right, we're looking at ways that concrete and other materials can be more ecologically friendly. But at the time, concrete began really as this accessory to human will. 